All right. Very good morning to you. It is Thursday on a Friday. Friday on a Thursday here. It'd be more accurate. Shane and Adrian are here. Also, Chris Jones, Louise Galvin, John Duggan, and Keen Tracy is going to do. You had to be there for us. So, uh, a busy, varied show. And we're also in France, in Metz. Lovely, lovely Metz. Kathleen, good morning to you. Bonjour, bonjour. We are you on Metz, aka my hotel room, because it is absolutely lashing rain. Oh, no. Outside, uh, so, I'm not able to show you guys any proper scenes just yet, anyways. Maybe tomorrow morning it's supposed to be a bit better. So, you flew into Luxembourg and got a train or a bus, or how close is Metz to Luxembourg? It's actually not too bad. So flew to Luxembourg, got a free bus into the city, which took about 10, 15 minutes. And then there was a delay on the train. So I did spend about an hour and a half on Luxembourg platform, which did bring me back to Perth a little bit. I was getting a little bit of PTSD from that. Uh, but then it's only like 40 minutes on a train. So it's actually very handy. Okay. And any sense of what the city is like? Is it a, I know nothing about Metz. Is it big? Is it small? <laughs> It's relatively small, so it's about 120,000 people population-wise. Had a bit of a wander around yesterday evening. Seems like quite a sleepy little city. It's really beautiful, very French, um, lots of beautiful old buildings and lots of like nice little wine bars and stuff. But yeah, I would say definitely a very chill city, um, but nice. And hopefully the rain is supposed to clear uh, later tonight and it's supposed to be about 25 degrees tomorrow, so... That will probably make for a nicer view for the game because the game's actually at nine o'clock French time tomorrow night, so it's quite late. Okay, so France versus Ireland, nine o'clock local time, eight o'clock our time. Uh, France expected to win this quite comfortably given that they're one of the best teams in the world, according to themselves, although also notorious chokers when it comes to uh, championships. Yep. Uh, if you were to look at it on paper, you would say that tomorrow night it's going to be an absolute hammering. But also we have seen with this Irish team that when there is an expectation of them against some of the bigger teams, they are actually able to pull out a performance. I think the choking that France has experienced has probably gone a little bit in the last few years since Hervé Renard took over. I think a lot of that came from their relationship with their manager, Corinne Diacre, who was in before, who just didn't treat the team well cut out their highest goal scorer, Eugène Le Sommer. So I think we're going to see a much more polished French team than we have seen in the past. But we have the experience of playing against the Mentala. We know what we're up against. And we have the added addition of having players like Aoife Mannion back, uh, bringing Anna Patton in, who is playing at the top level in the WSL. So I think we're probably in a better position now than we were when we played them before the World Cup, especially having the experience of those high-pressure occasions. But anything can happen on the night as well. Uh, this is the bit where it's be careful what you wish for slash this is where your dreams start to come true, right? And that's the <laughs> unknown unknown is how we're going to respond to stepping up in the level of competition. You win every game in your group in Division 2. You get to Division 1 and it's like, ooh, okay, we're playing with the big kids now. Exactly. Uh, I'm not going to say we're going to do like a fairy tale situation where from the World Cup over the next like four or five years, we're going to do a dairy and suddenly win Division One in one of the most <laughs> exciting matches that has ever happened. But uh, I think we we were talking about it on the Koi Gig podcast on Monday with Karen and looking at these games, ideally what you would love is getting a draw or something tomorrow night that kind of gives us a bit of faith going into the next couple of games. Even winning relatively even if France win if it's not a massive absolute hiding I think that'll serve us well going into the next couple of games because we have England at the Aviva it's a home game that's going to be even tougher and then we look at the likes of Sweden and I know Kira Caruso was talking about it and she she has three or four Swedish teammates uh, over in the US and she was saying that they were actually worried about getting Ireland because of how we had performed against them in campaigns past so there is definitely potential for us in this group in the same way there was probably potential for us in the World Cup group. It's just if we're mature enough to grab it and we've taken the lessons from the earlier Nations League campaign and saying, OK, we can't play that sort of free flow in football that we did where we let Katie McCabe and Denise O'Sullivan roam in the way we did. But we also learned that Caitlin Hayes is a really great asset when it comes to attacks alongside the like of Louise Quinn. So... But I, I suppose it's just moulding those things with a bit of reality. Any sign of uh, Le Renard Argent, <laughs> the silver fox? Pronunciation was uh, excellent there, by the way. 
<laughs> no sign as of yet, uh, but I haven't I haven't had too much time. I was in late enough last night, so. <laughs> he, he uh, it's such an interesting story. We, I know we we have had some uh, titillation about Irvin Aaron and the show over the last couple of months. Catherine, you've been central to a lot of that, by the way. So I hope you'll uh, you'll front up now in the press conference. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was the main talking point on the twenty-minute bus ride. That the journey was it? Had, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's a, it's an interesting story for people who aren't aware. Could you, like, you know, uh, his relationship with the French Football Federation? His, um, uh, you know, I might just head over to Africa here for a couple of months to help out the Ivory Coast over the last little while. And he ain't hanging around very long either way with France. No, he is. It was kind of a shock when he came into the French women's team in the first place because he has absolutely no relationship to women's football whatsoever, but has come in and taken what was a bit of a messed up side where the relationship between the manager and the players was really, really tenuous. Uh, all their top players were saying they were going to retire because of the way the manager was treating people. He's come in absolutely won over the players did relatively well with them in the World Cup. I think they'll be a little bit disappointed. Got to that Nations League final and then announced just before the end of... Uh, the By the end of the Olympics, he's going to move on again. So he wasn't there all that long. I think it's been about a two-year, ten-year now, two, three years. Um, and he... I think there's a lot of disappointment in French circles that he was moving on because he ha was so well-respected, but... Clearly, another little shiny thing has come into his view, and he's like, "Ah, oh, yes, I want some of that." Mm. Mm. <laughs> the the uh, Jerry mentioned about uh, the free bus. By the way, what? Like their local sort of um, council are not trying to screw people for every single. There's an opportunity <laughs> to make money here, Kathleen. What's happening? <laughs> Apparently, it started during COVID, so Luxembourg had one of the strictest COVID lockdowns that there were, and you know there was. Uh, limit on how long you could be out you couldn't be out past 11 o'clock at night and so to encourage people to stay off the streets they basically brought in this free bus scheme and then whenever covid ended people just had got so used to it that luxembourg being the country that it is with a little bit of money was like eh, we'll just keep it so yeah all the buses in luxembourg are free it's like the lewis was free uh, during the lockdown and it's still free still I, free I yeah, hear, yeah yeah, yeah. Still still free. Lewis is free. Yeah, don't don't pay for the Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> that, that did take me a split second to uh, to catch up with that. Um, but but so the team have had to get they they couldn't get a hotel in Metz, Kathleen. Is that the story? So they had to go to Luxembourg and get special dispensation. Yeah, so they couldn't find somewhere to stay here, which is interesting because I didn't find it particularly difficult. But maybe when you're bringing a squad of twenty six players plus management, it's harder <laughs> to find somewhere. So I think they're staying about 45 minutes. It's kind of like halfway between Luxembourg and Metz, which isn't that unusual. Like last year when they were at the training camp in Marbella, they were a good hour away from the pitch. So they're kind of used to staying maybe a little bit outside of where they're playing. And um, the stadium itself isn't that far from the city center. I looked it up last night. It's like a 10 minute walk and from where I am and I'm in the center of the town. So it's a, it's a very small city. I can see why there may not have been the space or what they're looking for. I assume they need like gym facilities and stuff, so there may just not have been a place with that in the city. I've been busy here doing research on things to do in Metz. There's not there's not a whole pile. There's the German Gate. There's the Metz Cathedral. There's a couple of shopping centres and famous people. You, you did say, Kathleen, it was quite small. Morgan Parra was probably the most famous oh, yeah. person out of out of Metz. Very good. good. First person to fly in a hot air balloon was also apparently from Metz as well. Your lingo now, Shane. Yeah, Shane, love that. Uh, Jean Francois Pilatre de Rosier. Who lived okay. from 1757 yeah. to 1785. Say it with confidence and quickly and you'll be grounded. Exactly. Not, not rolling off the tongue. No. So, yeah, not much to do. Or German say. Gate. Like, German Gate in yeah, France. Actually, so I went to see the cathedral last night. It was actually quite beautiful. Um, it was just the rain had just cleared. And, you know, when the sun starts to shine through ah. the clouds and everywhere it looks, there's a big grey stormy sky behind it, but the light was shining directly on the cathedral. It was quite pretty. Oh, very nice. Mm. Um... Uh, Courtney Brosnan is in the papers this morning. She obviously did press yesterday saying, no, we didn't have to talk to Emma Byrne. I, I, didn't, I didn't need to. We're all professional. And if we did need to have a conversation, we would have been professional about it. So uh, I'm not sure. Did they have to have a clear the air meeting at all? Maybe they did. I don't know. I feel like by the time that Emma went into the camp, she had fully changed her opinion on Courtney Brosnan. Obviously, we've had her on the Koi Gig pod and we would talk about Courtney quite a bit because... And is the number one Irish goalkeeper that we've had. So, and Courtney is probably going to get close to usurping her if she continues on the way that she is. 
And Emma would always say, I know she had said in the past that she didn't think that Courtney should be Ireland's number one, and that's because she wasn't playing consistently. Um, and even at the start of this season, before Emma got the Ireland gig, and it was looking a little bit dodgy as to whether Courtney was actually going to maintain that number one spot with Everton, even though she was performing so well. Emma was still a little bit on the fence about whether she should be starting goalkeeper despite everything that she'd done. She was very much of the opinion that Courtney should have not signed the contract with Everton before the World Cup and instead moved on and tried to get somewhere where she is in a starting berth to ensure that she was fit for Ireland and, you know, keeping herself tight and focused for Ireland. So I think she definitely, she changed her opinion. If she was still saying, I don't know if Courtney's the right person, they probably would have needed to have been a conversation, but she has always been very, very full of praise for Courtney in the last, like, two seasons, I would would say. Okay, so peace broke out in advance and it's all it's all grand now. It's an interesting one though, isn't it? Like pundits who become pundits but also want to get back into the coaching game. Like we saw O'Brien Kerr quite recently as well that he, it wasn't exactly a mea culpa coming out after the two friendies and saying, well, maybe I was wrong about this team or some of these players, but it kind of was a mea culpa in some ways as well. So it, le- it leads to an awkward conversation potentially. If you want to get dip your toes in punditry but still have a... Well, when Roy Keane makes that plunge in well, yeah, Shen, that's going to be pretty awkward. Yeah. Well, we actually did a really good episode of the Koi Gig podcast with Emma on that whenever it was announced that she was going to be joining the Ireland team permanently and that she would be leaving Koi Gig as a result because I assume it's a little bit awkward to talk about the players that you then have to go see whenever there's an international window. But um, she talked about that and how different she found it for the Nations League campaign, the last one, being in camp and actually seeing the players face-to-face and seeing what they're going through and how high the intensity was in the camp and it wasn't necessarily what she expected having been on the outside of it for so long so I think they're probably I think we can all admit working in the media that we are working with what we see in front of us and we are never going to know what it's like to be involved in the inner workings of a setup unless there's some particularly strange reason that we end up there so you're always going to see a little bit more and find out a little bit more about what is going on and also you have the added thing of, well, now I'm on the team. I'm not looking at it from the outside. These are these are my people. So I'm going to view it a little bit differently than someone who's sitting on the outside and able to criticize or compliment. Like it could go either way as well. You could walk in and say, wow, I thought this was bad and it's actually 10 times worse. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, that would, <laughs> that, would, that would go down very well. Uh, Mick McCarthy always used to say, you're either on the outside uh, pissing in or you're on the inside pissing out. And um as no one, I think, has ever put it more eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, can I ask you one? You're adding some finesse to my point, Ger. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kathleen, as someone who has been around this Irish team for uh, a number of years and obviously visited there or went over to the World Cup with them, have you noticed a change in attitude of the players? You know, when you walk, when you see them walking around training sessions, training camps in Abbottstown, is there an added air of, not cockiness, but confidence that they've now, you know, done and achieved something that they always set out to do in, in terms of qualifying for major tournament. Is there a difference, is basically what I'm asking you, in this Irish team and their demeanour now than there was, say, maybe two, three, four years ago? I think when you're talking to them, there probably is an added confidence of, well, we have achieved these things now and it's not just a pie in the sky idea for us anymore. I don't know if their demeanour necessarily has changed with it. Um, the other time you kind of notice it would be say after games now because there's way more people at games and things it's like a little bit harder for the players to get over to people as much and sometimes you see there's like a little bit of frustration because people are you know putting a lot of pressure on them to give away boots or sign placards or sign jerseys or whatever it is so it's probably those little elements that I've noticed more than their demeanor on the pitch I think we're still a little bit at the stage where, yeah, we got to the World Cup and that was great, but we almost need to get to the next major tournament to cement that that wasn't just a once-off. And I think the players are aware of that. So any sort of cockiness for them or uh, the idea that they've gone and achieved what they want to do isn't there just quite yet. Mm. Uh, all right, we'll talk to you tomorrow, Kathleen. We'll let you go and explore the uh, the many sites of Mets. Uh, a note from Cameron, our actual Francophile as opposed to 
some, some, of, yeah. some of the soods that we have around here. Symbolist poet Paul Verlaine also from Metz. He added the word poet there. It was symbolist. And I was like, oh, is that somebody just plays the symbols? But it turns out, no, he's... Um, <laughs> It's more than that. He's a, a poet noted for his something, something, something symbolism. Anyway, mm. there you go. I love you, that. There you go. You, 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 I will go and uh, amaze the people of Metz with all the knowledge that I've... Your Verlaine uh, interest. <laughs> Kathleen, thanks very much.